Welcome to the first of the videos detailing the mistakes you should avoid on your IB Biology exams. These are primarily taken from the 2011-2012 examiner's reports, but there are also some mistakes I've personally seen students make. So let's go through them one by one. Here we go. Students often get mixed up between the words glucose, glycogen and glucagon, so let's differentiate between them. Glucose is a carbohydrate, it's a monosaccharide used in respiration. Glycogen is also a carbohydrate, but it's a polysaccharide. And this is what animals use in their muscles to store glucose. Glucagon, in contrast to the previous two, is a hormone. This is secreted from the pancreas in order to raise blood sugar levels, blood glucose levels, that is. And it does this by prompting the liver to convert the glycogen into glucose. Continuing on the theme of hormones that control blood sugar levels, you have insulin as well as the glucagon previously mentioned. Now both of these are secreted from the pancreas, but students often fail to mention or get confused between the cells that secrete them. So insulin is secreted from the beta cells in the pancreas and glucagon is secreted from the alpha cells in the pancreas. So add this detail to your answers. In any answer that requires a calculation or if you have to read off of a graph, please make sure that you put your units. Even if the answer is worth only one mark, often the examiner cannot allocate the one mark without the units and there are no half mark allocations. If you are asked to read off of a graph during the exam, accuracy is of the utmost importance. Don't estimate anything, take a ruler to your IB Biology exam. If you're asked to read this value, for example, in 1980, the carbon dioxide concentration would be 338 parts per million by volume, not forgetting the units, they will have a set range within which they will accept answers. For example, their range may be 336 to 340 parts per million by volume. If you are outside of their given range, they will not allocate you the mark, so please be as accurate as possible. If you are asked to read off of a graph with two scales, please make sure that you're using the correct scale. For example, if I'm trying to find the temperature about 130,000 years ago, the peak that is, then you can see that I need to read off of the scale on the left hand side, the one that pertains to temperature, as opposed to the one on the right hand side that pertains to carbon dioxide. If I read off the correct scale, I find that it's about 4 degrees centigrade. You may be asked to calculate percentage change, so make sure you know the formula for that. It's the difference between the two values divided by the original value and multiplied by 100. As an example, let's say we've been asked to calculate the percentage increase in carbon dioxide concentrations, and we note that it goes from 338 to 360 parts per million by volume. First of all, you'd find the difference. 360 minus 338 gives you 22. And you're going to do the difference, 22, divided by the original or starting value, which is 338, multiplied by 100, and gives you a percentage increase of 6.5%. When asked to draw the structure of an amino acid, most students are aware that the amino acid contains an R, or a variable group. It has been commented on that very few students actually give an example of a specific R group, for example CH3, and that would make this alanine. Um, you can identify that as the R group and you can add that this is a variable group and it defines the specific amino acid. When relating between the term gene and homologous chromosomes, it's important to identify that the gene occupies a specific locus or position on the homologous chromosomes. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that the person has the same alleles. If the person had the same alleles, they would be termed homozygous, but it's possible for them to have different alleles and be heterozygous. You need to distinguish between the gene and the allele. The allele is defined as one specific form of a gene by the IB. And in the past, students have made mistakes by interchanging the term gene and allele because they didn't understand the difference. Mentioning homologous pairs of chromosomes, you have to distinguish between a homologous pair and sister chromatids. Sister chromatids are formed after each chromosome in the homologous pair replicates to produce identical copies of itself. Only after replication do you have sister chromatids. One chromosome, each chromosome in the pair, existing as sister chromatids. In the past, students have become confused between the term genotype and phenotype. 
So in an exam, for example, if it asks for a genotype, they've given a phenotype and vice versa. So make sure you know the difference. This here is a genotype made up of a recessive allele and a dominant allele. So this would be heterozygous. If the dominant allele were to represent brown, say for example for brown eyes, then the phenotype is the brown eyes. It's the observable characteristic. So make sure that you give what the question asks for, either a genotype or a phenotype. When representing the genotypes for colorblind and hemophiliac individuals, the IB has very specific notation that they want you to use. X lowercase b is used to represent colorblindness, while X lowercase h is used to represent haemophilia. Here I've reviewed all of the possible genotypes for individuals with and without haemophilia and colorblindness. Those that I'm ticking, those are unaffected females XX and males XY. These ones I'm indicating are affected and you should mention whether they're male or female. And then finally you have the carriers and these are the ones that contain an allele for either color blindness or haemophilia but it's not expressed in the phenotype. In other words, these individuals are not color blind nor do they have haemophilia. In the past, students have misidentified carriers and also have not used the correct notation when they're presented with genetic problems involving color blindness or haemophilia. So remember this notation. Photosynthesis involves combining carbon dioxide and water to produce glucose and oxygen. First of all, if you don't know the equation, memorize it. Higher students, you know this in a lot more detail. However, a question that comes up is where does the oxygen come from? And in fact, the oxygen comes from the photolysis of water. An incorrect answer in the past has been that it comes from the carbon dioxide, but you'll notice that the carbon dioxide combines with the hydrogen ions in order to produce the glucose. So the oxygen in the carbon dioxide goes into the glucose. The oxygen that's released as a waste product comes from the photolysis of water. Let's look at the mistakes students make when they're trying to explain how the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction varies with temperature. Most students are able to recognize the graph well. When you increase the temperature, you increase the frequency of collisions between the enzyme and the substrate. If you increase the temperature beyond the optimum temperature, this can result in denaturing the enzyme, which means that the shape of the active site changes. However, when you decrease the temperature, you decrease the frequency of collisions between the enzyme and the substrate. This is not the same as denaturing. You're just slowing down the reaction, decreasing the frequency of the collisions, but don't confuse it with denaturing. This is a mistake that students make. They say that the enzyme denatures at the lower temperatures as well, which is incorrect. Back to genetics and DNA, and students often confuse the enzymes involved in DNA recombination, which is part of genetic engineering, and DNA replication. So to review, DNA recombination involves restriction endonucleases to cut the DNA that you require, while DNA replication involves DNA polymerase. Do say DNA polymerase, there is an RNA polymerase. Both processes use DNA ligase, but for different reasons. In DNA recombination, the ligase is used to join the sticky ends on the plasmid, and in DNA replication, it's used to join the Okazaki fragments. So make sure you differentiate between the two processes and refer to the correct enzymes. There really is no excuse for not being prepared for a draw and label question. These are listed in the syllabus and you must practice them whether you're an artist or not. Students are losing easy marks. You have to make sure that your diagrams have a realistic shape, that they have the correct relative proportion of different structures within that diagram and the correct juxtaposition so the connections between structures in the diagram have to be correct. If you practice them you'll make sure that you get the marks not just for the labeling but also the one allocated to the quality of the diagram. On the theme of draw and label, if we look at drawing and labeling the carbon cycle as an example, students are able to correctly identify the reservoirs where carbon is stored. However, when they put the arrows between them, they're failing to label the processes that connect the transfer of carbon from one reservoir to another. So please make sure you label your arrows with the correct processes. Simple error to avoid. If you're writing the word sugar when actually what you mean to say is glucose, then please use the word glucose because it's far more specific. 
So in the biology course, you've learned about two kinds of cell division, meiosis and mitosis. A potentially major error is getting confused between the two. So mitosis is where you have a cell 2N diploid that's producing cells that are also diploid and genetically identical, therefore. Meiosis, you start with a cell diploid 2N and it produces haploid cells N, which are genetically different. Meiosis is a reduction division. When discussing and relating the structure and function of arteries and veins, students often fail to mention the pressure that the blood is under. So in the artery, you have a thick, smooth muscle layer because the blood is under high pressure and the vessel needs to be able to undergo that elastic recoil when the blood passes through at high pressure. In contrast, in the vein, the blood is at low pressure, so the smooth muscle layer is thinner than in the artery. Remember also that it's only the veins that have valves. Students also rarely mention that veins are situated in muscles so that when the muscle contracts, the blood is squeezed and pushed through the vein. Back to genetics and confusion between karyotyping and DNA profiling or thinking that they're the same thing, which they aren't. In karyotyping, this is when chromosomes are arranged according to size and structure in an image which we call a karyotype. In DNA profiling, in contrast, this is when DNA fragments are separated according to their size using gel electrophoresis, and this enables us to identify a criminal at a crime scene or to determine paternity. When explaining the relationships between monosaccharides, disaccharides and polysaccharides, students are often able to memorize examples of each of them but fail to explain exactly what the mono, di and poly mean. So monosaccharide is one monomer, for example, glucose. Di is two monomers put together, for example, maltose is made of glucose plus glucose. And poly is more than two monomers joined together to form, for example, starch or glycogen. On the note of joining monomers together, most students are able to well represent condensation and hydrolysis reactions. For example, condensation reaction is used to join glucose plus glucose to make maltose and water is also produced in the process. Hydrolysis is used to split maltose back into glucose plus glucose. Lysis refers to to separate. Most students don't mention though that this is aided by enzymes. For example, digestive enzymes break down maltose into glucose plus glucose. That particular enzyme would be maltase. When discussing diffusion, students often say that it does not require energy. Replace that term energy with the term ATP. You can then also use it with active transport and say that active transport requires ATP. ATP is a much better term than energy in this case. You certainly have to learn your word definitions, but here's an example where students lose marks. When they define homeostasis, they fail to say the maintenance of a constant internal environment within narrow limits. You have to learn your word definitions word for word. When discussing the mechanism of ventilation, students get confused between when the diaphragm is relaxed and when it's contracted. It's relaxed during exhalation. Then you have a contracted diaphragm during inhalation. This means that the volume of the lungs is increased, the pressure is decreased, and the air enters into the lungs from the outside atmosphere. 